The Pentagon says plans are now in the works for a grand military parade. President Trump asked for one after seeing last year's Bastille Parade in France. Let's discuss with the panel tonight. Kevin Madden, CNN political commentator and Republican strategist. Patrick Healy, CNN political analyst and New York Times deputy culture editor. Paul Begala. Begala, I know how to say his name. <laughs> um, CNN political commentator and Democratic strategist. And Steve Lonigan with the Courageous Conservative Political Action Committee. Did I say your name wrong? No, you have Okay, right. good. Right. All right, great. Everyone's names are right. Perfect. So uh, I think we're just going to listen quickly to something that Senator Graham said earlier today. I don't, okay, well, anyway, we were going to play something that Senator Graham said earlier about this idea of a military parade, that there's nothing really wrong with the idea of honoring the troops, right? What he said uh, is that he just doesn't like the idea so much of honoring, like, the, I can't remember the exact, hardware, hardware is what he said, you know, basically the tanks and that kind of stuff. So what do you make of that? You know, why does the president want to do this more, like, show of force kind of parade, it seems like? Steve. Oh, may I? Well, I happen to think we already have one. It's called Fleet Week right here in New York, and people love it. We show up for American Navy. We come right up the Hudson River. Lots and lots of ships. People pour out. It builds American patriotism. It's a wonderful thing. So we might as well show off to the rest of the world, and we're the best. Well, okay. So, like I said, I would make a distinction between something that honors the troops, Paul, which I think is that's, that's more what that's about, don't you think, versus... Well, I guess I should just ask you, what do you think of this? I mean... Uh, look, everybody wants to honor... The troops. I, I'm not sure if the distinction is proper between, well, troops versus hardware. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do you best honor the troops? Uh, is this something the troops really want? Okay, I, I never served a day, okay? I, I didn't finish the Boy Scouts. <laughs> but my dad was in the Army, my stepfather was in the Army, my father-in-law spent his whole career in the Army. My grandfather fought in World War I, which is, I guess, what they're going to try to honor. It's the 100th anniversary of our victory in World War I. I never met a soldier who said, gee, I'd like to march around for no particular reason in front of the big shots. And I, I think spending all that money and putting those troops through that is, it, it, I'm all for honoring, I really am. And, uh, but I just think that this is actually more about the ego of the commander in chief than showing appreciation to the men and women in uniform. Or well, the ego of America. Well, I don't well, know. No, it's the ego of the commander in chief. Yeah. I mean, I remember when I was covering Trump during the campaign and he talked a great deal about how impressed he was with the generals and how impressed he was with American military might. And why didn't we show that on TV more? Why didn't we show that on TV more? I mean, usually, you know, you have uh, other countries uh, when they when they are sort of projecting force, there is some sense sort of a need to do that and mm -hmm. show that they are important, show that they are a power. Normally, the president of the United States doesn't need to roll out the artillery to show that America is a powerful right, country. Right, Kevin, so who in the world actually doesn't know that the U.S. Is, has a huge military? And sort of to that point, isn't the reason France does this is because they're not a major <laughs> military power and they're yeah. kind of hearkening back to when they used to be? Yeah, I think, it, I think it sends the wrong message to our allies as well as our opponents. I think one of the, the look, they, these, are, these are not, we have had them before, but they're not, uh, they're pretty atypical. And I think the reason being is that in the United States, we've always put the emphasis on um, uh, uh, the fact that America wants to defend principles and we want to honor the service of, of the individuals. And I think why you see these in autocratic regimes or you see them in places where dictators uh, run the show, it's because they want the emphasis put on the state, mm -hmm. on the military, on the dictator. And I just think that's the wrong type of message. We want to send a message to our allies around the globe that we're here to promote the, and defend liberty, democracy, and freedom. Um, but we don't need military parades to do it. Right. Do you think, Paul, though, this feels a little bit like it could be a setup for the Democrats Absolutely. to come out and oppose it? Absolutely. And then they say, why do you hate the troops? Absolutely. And it's not the biggest thing. The parade I want to see is the parade of Mr. Trump and all his aides marching off to the grand jury <laughs> to testify. That's the parade I'm most interested in attending, and I will well, applaud respectfully. Happen, obviously. Uh, well, hide and wait, Steve. <laughs> yeah. But I, I do think, I, but I think we ought to think about what this does say about our country. You know, I've had the honor of serving the White House in the Oval Office, the resolute desk behind which President Trump sits, behind which President Clinton sat, President Kennedy famously. That desk has the great seal of the United States on it. But because it's an old desk from the 19th century, it's the original seal. It's an eagle. And in one talon, the eagle has arrows to show that we're ready for war. In the other, it has olive branch because we stand for peace. Back in the old days, 19th century, the eagle was turned toward the arrows. After our victory in World War II, 
Harry Truman said, we don't have anything to prove anymore. Mm -hmm. We prefer peace. And he turned the eagle's head around. Every seal of the United States now has the eagle facing toward peace. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I just, I do wish uh, our, our president, uh, who served so heroically, oh, wait, no, <laughs> who avoided military service, went out of his way to, because he's a rich, well, brat. I wish that he would maybe listen to Harry Truman, who helped save the I world. Feel like World Steve War II. wants to say something. Oh, I don't know. How much time did Barack Obama serve in the military or Bill Clinton? For hey, that he didn't matter. order the troops to go parade in front of him. And... He didn't order the troops to parade in front well, of him. Well, so Barack Obama certainly did a lot to dismantle the American military. We finally see well, the military live. being built up again. We put an end to the Obama destroy the military destroying Obama sequestration programs. Uh, the world knows our American military is getting stronger every single day. Every Se single day. And it's about time to show the rest of the world. Wasn't really just Barack Obama. Oh, we uh, Barack Obama. There are a lot of people who have the fingerprints of sequestration. Yeah. And also, if you're worried Particularly about Barack where Obama. we deploy our resources and where we put a priority and an emphasis, it ought to be on rebuilding the military, not on spending precious time, precious effort, precious resources having military parades. And I think we just show the rest of the world that we have the most powerful military in the world. So when Korea has this who doesn't know that? Parade, <laughs> the, 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 well, apparently, <laughs> that? apparently a lot of people around President the world Obama, don't know that. And President Obama didn't need... Uh, to show great military might. Well, when they, got, when they, when they killed it. Osama That's bin Laden. When they because he Osama dismantled the military. <laughs> That's why he didn't have to show the need. Because he did one everything he could to demoralize America's military. Right. One could and argue that, that, that okay. the, the country went to war in Afghanistan, in Iraq. It spent five years. So he said, we were facing an incredible you know, gave financial decline coming off of the Bush administration. Okay, the idea of everything. spending a lot of money on military wasn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. We're only defeating um, ISIS now, aren't we? Uh, ISIS is going to stand down once they see the parade. That's true. They yeah. will just fall. <laughs> oh, it'll kind just, of blow their yeah, minds no, a little bit. They're just going to, yeah. like, open a hot dog stand. Mm, well, they're done. Okay. On that, <laughs> Paul has the last word. Uh, coming up, White House Chief of Staff John Kelly's insult to young immigrants is not going over well with some Democrats or, frankly, some Republicans. We'll find out how his comments are complicating Dreamer and budget talks. The Republican moral cowardice must end. Members of Congress are trustees of the people and of our nation. Why are we here if not to protect the patriotic young people who are determined to contribute and to strengthen America? So I'm going to go on as long as my leadership minute allows. Democratic leader Nancy Pelosi speaking there on the floor, and she's still speaking. Pelosi has been going for more than four hours talking about DACA recipients. Her remarks come just one day after White House Chief of Staff John Kelly suggested some undocumented immigrants are, quote, too lazy to apply for Dreamer benefits. Let's bring back the panel. Paul, what are your thoughts on this? Unhelpful. Look, General Kelly, uh, he's a fine man, he's a war hero, given his everything to our country. His job is very difficult. It's to keep the trains on the tracks in Trump land, and that's hard to do. This is one of the rare occasions where he's been unhelpful. He's now derailed what's what's uh, looks like a promising bipartisan agreement on the budget, which could be a very big win for his boss. I, I, I wonder if he doesn't want those words back. He seems to want to double down on it, which I think is foolish. I've been a staffer. Staff guys, and he's, he's just staff now. I know he's a four-star a little while ago. He's just a staff guy now. And he has actually hurt his boss's cause of trying to get the kind of budget deal he wants. Right. Well, I think, actually, I want you guys to listen to um, something that we have, if we could play... Um, the sound on um, un the one about under attack. The nation is under attack. This is Kelly at G George Washington. But make no mistake, we are in fact a nation under attack. We are under attack from criminals who think their greed justifies raping young girls at knife point, dealing poison to our youth, or just killing some of us for fun. We are under attack from people who hate us, hate our freedoms, hate our laws, hate our values, hate the way we simply live our lives. We are under attack from failed states, cyber terrorists, vicious smugglers, and sadistic radicals. So in this, he, this was 2017, and he, he basically takes undocumented immigrants and puts them in the same category with terrorists, and then also, I think, uses some language that sound a lot like <clears throat> Donald Trump's announcement speech, talking about people holding knives to girls and, and raping them. I mean, I feel like he's not actually this moderating force. Or, or, Steve, do you have no problem with what he just said? Well, I think it's hard to judge every single one of 1.8 million people who's lazy, who's not lazy, who's hardworking. I'm sure there's some of them in that whole big group, but I think there's a bigger issue here. You know, the political class thinks a lot of their DACA program, but apparently two-thirds of those folks who could sign it don't think enough of it. In other words, many of these people haven't signed up because they don't think much of the program. It's or, just another failed government program. Or... And even the doctors know that. Or 
they were maybe afraid that they were going to come out of the shadows or and they someone might come into power who would revoke. Yeah, and it doesn't help the conversation when you offer that type of uh, sweeping generalization of their of their uh, instincts on this. And there is a lot of other reasons. There are a lot of either other. Look, one of the main reasons is that it costs five hundred dollars to sign up. Some of these folks may not have the money. Others are scared that they're going to have to come out of the shadows, and so all of a sudden they're going to get a visit from ICE. So there are very real, tangible fears that are driving um, that are driving some of these DACA recipients to not sign up. But look, if you look at uh, General Kelly's comments. They are perfectly in line with this administration's policy. It's not a surprise to me at all that we heard this. And if you think, if you if you recognize the fact that every president is essentially a, a reflection of the entire organization of his administration of his government, it's perfectly in keeping with, uh, with that that his chief of staff would use that type of language. Right. So yeah. So I think the conventional wisdom was, oh, here comes John Kelly, and he's going to he's so different, and right. he's just sort of there to protect America from. From Donald Trump, and that's not the case at well, all. Well, he came right? in to, to to try to get the trains running on time, yeah. and to try to bring some logic and predictability to the Oval Office to try to stop the the comings and goings of lots of people, including some reporters, you know, getting in there. So, in terms of bringing some kind of um, you know sort of better systems in place, yes. But in terms of immigration issues. Look, President Trump set the tone with the announcement speech, the way that he talked about Mexicans, the way that he talked about illegal immigrants with the um, inauguration speech, talking about this American carnage. Mm -hmm. I mean, that language feels very much uh, of a piece. I think Kevin is, is right about that in a lot of ways. On immigration issues, Kelly and President Trump seem you know, uh, very, very um, in sync there. But I will say, I lived in lower Manhattan for 13 years, and I know people, I like pizza, I like to eat pizza. I know people at a pizza joint down there at the Bodega where I buy some of my groceries, who I talk to regularly. Uh, they are immigrants, they have family um, in this country who are undocumented. And the reality is they are very scared of this government. They are very scared, frankly, of a, of a Democrat or a Republican government in terms of trusting Why? how the government is going to protect them. Because they think that if they put up their hands, if they ask for the benefits, if, they come, out scared, that's if why. they come out, no, if they come out forward, that ultimately a President Trump, from what they heard, was that basically everybody's going to be rounded the up. When he gave that they, speech they in it Phoenix from? They're during the general from, from, election. From who? Well, hang on, Steve. Are you uh, suggesting that they're Trump incapable of, like, anybody else reading a newspaper? Or, I mean, I, I'm not to, saying listen, that. Listen I'm saying to, who's listen. telling them they have to be scared? Is it Donald Trump? President Donald Trump has extended it again. As Donald a Trump said he would make a deal on the DACA issue with okay. the Democrats. As a candidate, he very memorably said that we're going to not only just deal with the immigration issue, but we're going to start going after groups and sending them like back MS to their Like MS-13, and we should do that. He's we also should say very also, general. Also, very okay, general. we're getting the music thing. of death. Yeah. <laughs> it's time to stop. Um, thank you, everybody, for an interesting conversation.